Yeah. Yeah. Pro Fan Sports Podcast. Let's get it. Pro Fan. Tune into the program. Every single week, get the dope, fam. Sean on the mic, very flat, too. Keep you updated, that's what we do. Pro Fan. Tune into the program. Pro Fan. Tune into the program. Pro Fan. Tune into the program. Every single week, get the dope, fam. Yo, what to do, everybody? It's your boy John Altador with Pro Fan Sports Podcast. Back at you with another one with my boys Vlad, Barry, and today back on the show. Welcoming back sports anchor for WCVB Channel Five, Mike Lynch, and also um, co-host of Bloomberg Business of Sports. How you doing, Mike? I'm doing great, John. How you guys doing? All right. Thanks for having me. You had me back on. You, you ran out. Of, everybody else said no, and they. You finally went to me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're just going through people that we've had on and we've had a great time talking to. And, you know, uh, fortunately for us, you were one of those, you know, people we enjoyed having on the show. And uh, we're really happy to have you back on. You know, we were talking earlier about, you know, uh, some struggles uh, that took place, but we're really happy to see you you know, on the show, thriving. And um, I think we, we uh, sent out a few tweets, you know, in that whole situation, too. So yep. really happy to see you back on here, man. Yeah, thank you. Um, you guys are really kind to me. And every, everybody's been unbelievably nice. Uh, last May, I had a stroke. Um, the Celtics were playing that night around 8.40. At 8.30, I went, to, I said, you know what? I'm tired of sitting on the couch. I just went for a walk around the block. And halfway around the block, I'm hopping and puffing, and boom, I get out. And uh, I suffered a massive uh, stroke and, uh, on the right, left side of my brain, which affects the right side of my body. And, um, you know, I, uh, thanks to uh, all the good wishes from people like you and all the other people out there and the people at Spalding Rehab in Charlestown, um, I've gone a long way. Look, I can, I can stand up right here, stand up on my own, my right eye. This is the side that's paralyzed. I can move this. I still get my, my, my uh, jab up there. Um, I can, uh, they're still working on the coordination here, but um, I'm doing well and uh, it's going to be a long haul, but uh, I'm up for it and I'm going to, I'm going to win. You know, this, uh, I never entered any type of game or competition where I thought I was going to lose and this is no different. Hey man, you're, you're a champion in all ways. So um, you don't have any doubts that, you know, you make a completely full recovery, you know, kind of like, um, you know, that kind of reminds me of, uh, what, Teddy Bruschi kind of went through a situation yeah. like that, you know, back in the season. You yeah. know, you were playing for the Patriots, you know. Um, and we know these things, you know, these things are things you can get through and over. And, you know, I don't think you're going to be any different. So, again, man, it's, re- it's really great to see that you're doing well. And, um, again, thanks for coming on the show, man. Um, pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, we – right now – we have two teams in Boston right now that's like playing unbelievable, you know. I know. Um, and it's the two current teams right now, uh, Celtics and Bruins. You know, uh, what are your thoughts on, on the Celtics and the Bruins right now? Well, I'm, you know, I, I, I was uh, born, grew up here, never left here. I've been a Celtic fan my whole life and a Bruins fan as well. And, and this is a dream come true because I don't think any city has ever had two teams, the basketball and hockey team, win it in the same year. Uh, they've had teams in the finals, one won and one lost. Um, and, and I'm excited. What worries me is that things have gone too well for both teams. The Celtics haven't had any major injuries or any major setbacks, and the same thing for the Bruins. And, you know, what you do all year long is okay, but it's, when you start playing well early March into April when the playoffs start, that's what matters most. So I'm hoping that Neither one of these two teams has, has left their, their best uh, on the floor. I mean, I, I doubt it, but you never know. I, I don't think it's going to be a cakewalk for the Celtics to, to win the East. I think Milwaukee's a tough opponent. A Philly, as we, as we know, is, is Philly. Um, and the Bruins still got Tampa Bay Lightning. They're still in the Eastern Conference. And uh, so um, let's hope they both go. Nothing would make me, me happier. Absolutely, man. Um, you know, in your opinion, you know, uh, given that the Bruins or Celtics make it, you know, um, 
which team would you be most disappointed in if they didn't, you know, end up victorious this season? You know, since the Celtics were there last year, I think that they, they, they were knocking on the door. You know, they were up 2-1 to one in that series. Um, I probably might be a little more disappointed in the Celtics. Um, but, you know, they've got, you know, Brown and Tatum have been together now for a half a dozen years. And you go to Bergeron and Marchand uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the Bruins. It's great. They've been together for 15 years or, or so. Um, but I think I, I would probably be more disappointed if the if the Celtics the Celtics didn't win it because I, I I just think that uh, when they were there last year and so close that they should be back and know what to do and know how to go out and conduct themselves and win the darn thing. I think I agree, man. You know um, they came out really hot, best team in the NBA, and they still what got the best record in the NBA by what like half a game or something like that. Yeah, half the game over Milwaukee. <laughs> yeah, who's on a 14-game winning streak, right? Yeah, yeah. 14. <laughs> I, I don't know what's up with the Suns. I was here crossing my fingers. I'm like, give us one game. And they just play, close it out. You know, but, you know, nothing comes easy in sports. And it, it shouldn't be easy, you know, for us to get where we need to get to. Um, you know, uh, the Celtics just – made it official and um, hired Joe Mazzulla as the full-time head coach. Um, you know, I know you've been watching all season. Uh, what do you think of the Celtics head coach and, you know, um, and he, the improvements he's made, you know, throughout the season? I think he's done a great job. He came in with a lot of pressure on him. Um, you know, the Eastern Conference champions, anything less than that, he'd be, uh, you know, be a disappointment. Obviously, ownership. Uh, felt so much confident in, in him that they uh, named him the the, uh, the permanent head coach, which I think is great. I think it's it, it's really ironic that both teams um, have new head coaches. The Bruins have Jim Montgomery and and Maz with the uh, with the Celtics, and both those guys in their rookie year as as head coach uh, for the Boston teams anyway um, are leading have the best record in, in their both leagues respectively. I think it would be a great story. I mean. It, it, be, it has never happened before, um, and it would be a great story. We'd have, we'd have to have two parades, one on one day, and then everyone may, maybe rest up and then come back and do it with one another. We have, have, have to have a day off in between. Someone made this suggestion to me um, the other day, saying that maybe if both teams end up winning it, they should have the parade the same day. <laughs> yeah, <the hell? laughs> well, I don't know what y'all think about that, but I thought that was kind of pretty cool and interesting. It would be fascinating to see both teams have uh, just a parade together if they both end up winning the championship this year. That, that would really be something. I, I don't think the sidewalks are thick enough because they'd be about six deep for both teams. Um, yeah. well, you know, the last time both of them had a parade, I remember uh, the Celtics parade down, where is it, down at Coffee Square, I think. And um, um, and they both were enormous. I mean, you, you, you could not come away from both those parades and say, well, more people love the Celtics than the Bruins, and more people love the Bruins than the Celtics. It's just as many people love each, each one of these two teams. And they showed up, and they showed it. The last time they, they won 08 for the Celtics and um, 11 for the Bruins. It would be cool if both teams have it on the same day and each team start on the different side of the city and then they meet in the middle or something. Oh. That would be like... Ooh, that would be awesome. That would be, oh, like, yeah. really dope. Like, <laughs> Oh, yeah. And then uh, maybe in the <laughs> middle there's amazing. some sort of concert or something. I don't know. Some sort of, like, stage where they get to talk. That would be, that would be amazing. You know, I, ho I hope both leagues are smart enough um, to not play on the same night. Mm. You know, like, you know, the Bruins yes. playing the same night. Oh, that, my that, God. That, that it's going to be It's going to be an exciting summer because we had a pretty uneventful winter with the Red Sox not doing well and the Patriots not doing well. If both of those teams get together in the playoffs and they make it very far, wow, that's, that's a very exciting summer for Boston. The bars yeah. are going to be full. <laughs> <laughs> every night, every playoff game. Yeah. Every yeah. night, every night. That, that's how I got myself into trouble. Like I was sitting on the couch last 
last year and I said, I'm really gaining some weight here. I've got no exercise whatsoever because I'm not <laughs> just eating dinner, have a couple glasses of wine. Now I'm sitting and watching a three, three hour basketball game. So I went for a walk around the block. If I didn't go for a walk around the block, I probably wouldn't have had the stroke. So I'm going to play the Bruins and Celtics for playing every year and night. <laughs> into a couch yeah. potato. Yeah. Well, we, 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 we have um, on the Celtics, we have like two really good point guards. We got Derek White and um, and Marcus Smart. And what, what do you think should should be the starting person? And the, what do you think should be finishing the game? You know, I know the other night that the uh, White had some, some great numbers when he was on the floor. I think they were plus 25 or something like that. And, and Smart <laughs> wasn't. But – I, I just I go with Marcus Smart. I think that you know, good t- good things seem to happen when he's on the floor and he's around the basketball. And you know, I I'd ra- I I'd, I'd rather go with him towards the end of the game. But but Derek White is, is uh, you know he actually he actually distracted Embiid just for a split second before yep. he threw that seventy foot shot up. You know, and and like that split second was the difference in them going. To, they they'd still be playing, you know, yep. if, if <laughs> and, and if, if you watch the replay, he just, just gets in the way enough just to just, just to hold, have him cl- hold the ball for an extra half second. And then, you know, we saw in the replay from the rear, um, the, the, the uh, rectangle on the backboard lighting up and we, you know, it was no question that uh, he didn't let it go in time, but you watch, if you, if you see the replay again, take a look at what Derek White did. So, talking about that game, that was that was a very exciting game. That was one of the most exciting games to, of the season. I mean, we've we've been beating the 76ers, but for the past I don't know five six years, and yeah. that that was a very close game, very exciting game. Almost went to overtime. I thought that and being and shot. I thought that went in, but I'm glad it didn't. Um, but what do you think is 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 we should be? What do you think we should be watching out for in the East? Well, you got to watch out for Milwaukee. I mean, and um, you know what's going to be interesting. Uh, remember when um, uh, Tatum went to his son's birthday party and missed the game? You know, if we lose uh, the number one seed by one game, and the Celtics don't get to play a game seven against Milwaukee in Boston. Tatum's going to hear a lot of uh, he's going to hear a lot of resentment toward him, you know, for, for going to the, to, to the birthday party and and the Celtics lost that basketball game. Now I know that's a long way down the road, but right now you're looking at the standings and they're separated by on Monday, February 27th. We're doing the show and they're separated by a half a game. So um, who knows what's going to happen? Some 20 odd games left, and uh, I just hope it doesn't doesn't come to that. Because, you know, you know how people are. You know, everybody in Boston's going to look for a reason why something went wrong. And uh, I, I would hate to see them, you know, point the finger at Tatum for that. Yeah. Well, I don't know because I'm just so, like I said on the last uh, episode, and I'll say it again, uh, Mike, that I'm so confident in this team's ability to not only get back to the finals but to win it that, I don't fit necessarily feel like they need, you know, home court advantage. I still feel, you know, really great that if they ever, if it comes to a situation in the playoffs where they have to play a big road game um, against the Milwaukee or against the Philly or any team in the Eastern Conference or in the finals, I feel as though, uh, you know, they're definitely more than capable and, and certainly like their chances of being able to get, you know, win that game even on other teams' home court, even if they have to play game seven in, um, you know, Milwaukee or in Philly or, um, you know, or any other, uh, you know, arena besides uh, the TD Garden. So I get, you know, home court advantage is certainly great to have and is, um, you know, important, uh, you know, for, for the most part. But I feel like this is such a great team and that they play really well on the road as they did last postseason. I think they've continued that this regular season that, um, you know, they still can beat anybody, you know what I'm saying, anytime, anywhere, whether that's in Milwaukee or Philly or any place that they'd have to play in order to win in the playoffs. I, I think they, they definitely are. <clears throat> um, I think they're a tougher, tougher team than they were last year, the Celtics. I think, you mm-hmm. know, they, 
they, they don't get down. They don't, they don't panic. Uh, I think the one guy, I almost look to see how he does each game, and I can tell you whether they're going to win or going to lose, and that's Al Horford. You know, for some reason, he had three big threes the other night. Now, they went down in the third quarter against, against Philadelphia. And, you know, I said, if Al's hot, you know, that takes a lot of heat off of Tatum, a lot of heat off of Brown. And, uh, you know, they don't have to score 30 and 30 themselves. They can get 18 or 20 from, from Al. You know, that takes a lot of pressure off them. So, you know, I, I would keep an eye on him going down the stretch and into the playoffs and see, you know, as Al Horford goes, do the Celtics go? Absolutely. And he was huge the other night uh, against Philly. I mean, he was really the guy that really turned that game around and was the turning point of that game that really changed the whole momentum when he hit those three threes in the third quarter. And uh, what, in a matter of two minutes or so in that, they were down 15 and that brought like the lead to six and that pretty much got them really back, you know, into the game and just swung the whole momentum. So I certainly agree with that. Horford's a really, you know, big and important player for this team and, uh, and, and certainly always seems to make, you know, the big plays and the big shots when this team, uh, you know, needs, you know, someone to step up other than the Jays, um, you know, and our main scorers. So I guess, you know, that's certainly why they call him play off out. But, uh, you know, even though we're still in the regular season, he still comes up big in those, uh, you know, big games when you need him to. Yeah. I love the fact they could. I love the fact they could boo the other night in Philadelphia, and he just silenced them with his. With his, oh, with his yeah. That was great. Oh yeah, they still hate him there for that one year he was there. They felt like they robbed, why. They robbed him because you know uh, Al's done well in all the stops that he's made, except for Philadelphia. So maybe the Philadelphia should look at themselves. Uh, but before we continue, you know we have a. Uh, another Boston sports legend, you know, joining the, the, the podcast right now um, is former WBZ sports director, Bob Lobel. Thank you for coming on, Bob. How you doing? Yeah, I'm great. Thanks. I'm, it took a while, but I figure if Lynch can make it on here, I should be able to make it on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, That's awesome. Welcome to the show, Bob. It's great to have you. Thanks, Gary. I really apologize. I mean, I worked my butt off to get through this computer, so. (laughs) No no worries. We appreciate your hard work, and we appreciate you being on here. You think I I had had anything to do with it, keep you off off so I get more air time? Yeah, of course you did. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I have one question. You guys, I I said one question since you were talking about the 76ers. And uh, if Joel Embiid shot had been before time ran out, and can you imagine how, if he were fouled at that? If that <laughs> oh that could have turned. God. Think about that. How, think how close. Think of how close they came to actually losing that game. If if you know a half a second. And if he'd have been fouled, and there were two guys on him, I've watched the thing like four or five times to make sure he wasn't fouled. But that would have been a four-point play to lose the game. I mean, that's how close they were to that. From 70 feet. Yeah. I mean, that's, it was unbelievable. And it wasn't the only one from 70 feet. Uh, this was an amazing weekend <laughs> in the NBA for shots like that. Yep. Absolutely, man. You know, what? Joel Embiid dropped 40 points. You know, man, this dude, he's just like, I'm not sure what it is. Like he, he's MVP caliber player and yet he hasn't won one yet. Um, but you know, it just seems like he can't get over the hump sometimes, but that was an unbelievable shot. You know, uh, Bob, I heard somewhere Jason Tatum said that, you know, you made that play for that last shot he took. I was. (laughs) You You drew that play up. Grew up. No, I don't think it was me. It might have been. Uh, I don't know where. No, it was, it was uh, his general manager. <laughs> Stevens, right? No, it wasn't me. It was Brad. Yeah. I, I couldn't well, have Brad drawn that play up. You know, Red Arback couldn't have drawn that play up. Brad <laughs> <Stevens>. <laughs> uh, I thought Brad got it from you, man. I thought uh, he got well, it from maybe you. I don't know. He doesn't call me very often for plays. 
Barry. So. <laughs> what are, I mean, they're, they're firing on all cylinders. I don't, you know, they are really, uh, I, Lynch and I were talking this morning about, you hope it doesn't have to go seven games against Milwaukee because of that game that both Tatum and Brown sat out before the all-star game. Remember they both sat out and uh, they ended up losing the game and, and either Tatum or Brown played and then they played in the all-star game and you hope it doesn't go to Milwaukee in, in the playoffs and they go to a seventh game in Milwaukee. Uh, you know, these are little things that can tip the scales, you know, any way you want. I just have a feeling we're not going to hear the end of that, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. It's an amazing, been an amazing run for them. All right. You know what? It's like, Embiid, like, or Doc, the coach was never existed. And when they came into the season, it's like he, it's gone. It's like wiped from everybody's memory. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's it is absolutely. No, when you when you think about it, you're like, who? I almost forgot Eme's name one time. I'm like, whoa. whoa. Oh, I'm trying to remember <laughs> him. Hey, of Doc, you know, like, there it is. This was a perfect example, John. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Um. But, you know, Joe Mazzula has come in and done a, a, a great job, you know, to, to keep things going and actually made the team a little better, it feels like. And, you know, what do you say about, you know, the Celtics' depth? Because I feel like last year that's what, you know, was one of our main issues, especially in the playoffs. And now, you know, our bench guys are taking Milwaukee to, you know, uh, an overtime game, you know, at full strength. Think about, think about Stevens trading for White when they brought him in. It was like an off, you know, it was like an offhanded trade. Like, okay, the guy's going to help us out defensively, and the guy's become a key player for them. I mean, it's just been, it's, it's been an amazing process of way they, the way they built this this team to where it is where it is today. Blake Griffin, even, you know, I mean, you know, it's like. He can do all the ads he wants for, you know, vegetables and everything else. It's a pretty cool ad. But I'm just saying, <laughs> these guys, these guys have personality, and they have. It's cool. It's pretty cool. Absolutely, man. I think you know the sky's the limit for the Celtics this year. You know, um, you know another obviously team in Boston that that's been a hot topic. Obviously, uh, the NFL is. Uh, you know, a full year situation now, right? You know, now we've got the off season, people talking about trades that need to be made. Uh, the Patriots, uh, you know, hired a couple coaches, a couple coaches left. Um, what What are your thoughts, you know, Mike and Bob, what are your thoughts on last season, um, how that went and, you know, how we need to move forward and pretty much right the ship, you know, going into this year? Let she go. Well, uh, <clears throat> I think the number one problem or the number one concern is the quarterback. Um, he went backwards this year. And I said it this morning on our podcast with Bob and Dan Shaughnessy, I said that, um, you know, he was playing for a, a defensive guy. Matt Patricia was the offensive coordinator. And I think that Mac Jones had a better idea on how to get the ball into the end zone than Matt Patric Patricia did. And <laughs> – it's really sad to say that, that, a, that a quarterback knows more than a coach. But in this particular instance, I think that that's the case. And it was frustrating for him because he just – they just never, 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 never let him work vertically. Everything was horizontal. He had a 40-yard pass for a three-yard game. And I think uh, we, we should see a difference with Bill O'Brien. And I think Bill O'Brien would – I think this kid has a chance – to, to really blossom and flourish under Bill O'Brien. And uh, this is going to be a, a critical year. If he doesn't under Bill O'Brien, then we get a quarterback problem. Well, Mike and I disagree on this. I think he is not the guy to care quarterback the Patriots in the future. I just, I don't see it. I think he goes down too quickly. I, there's a lot of things. I mean, he does. Yeah, he can pass. Like he should be able to pass. You, you know, he played at Alabama and, you know, he, he should be able to play the position, but I don't think he can play the position in the National Football League the way the Patriots need it. 
if he played. He might be able to do it for some teams, but I don't think this is a good fit for him. It may not be his fault. It may be, a, may be the team's fault, but I don't think it's, you know, whether it's his fault or not, I just don't think this is a good fit. Would you trade him? Yeah, I would. I would, because I don't think he's the future. But I, again, for, for what? Trade him for what? Would I bring Garofalo back? I would. Wow. Really? That's a Ooh, better word. Woof. Woof. It's a hot take right there. Woof. <laughs> well, I mean, disagree with me. I know I think Garofalo is a better quarterback. But he can't stay on the field. Okay, he that's, plays fair. Hard enough no, that's, that's fair. That's fair. What's that going to do? That's fair. Right. I hear you. I would. So I you already it. done with Mac Jones. You already want to trade him and get rid of him and I'm just pro- saying it's not a good fit. I'm saying it's not a good fit here. He could probably go out there and be great for the 49ers. Or the Raiders. Or the Raiders. Quarterback now? Yeah. Okay, I'll get off of that subject. If they don't get in Aaron Rodgers, I think they're trying to get Aaron Rodgers, the Raiders. (laughs) He's not coming here. Do you think so? Garoppolo? No, No, Aaron Rodgers is not coming here. No, no, he's going to the Raiders. He's going to play in Vegas. You think so, huh? I do. All right. I do. (laughs) I I, I think it's going to happen. I think he's going to. I think he's sitting in Green Bay. I think he's sitting in Green Bay, but but I, I disagree with you, Bob. I, I think we know more about Garoppolo, and I think we've seen Garoppolo not able to make it through a full season. That's one. But also, even when he plays, like he's he hasn't been spectacular. He hasn't been able to carry that team. I mean, he got lucky that he made it to that one Super Bowl. But I just I don't think you get lucky to make it to a Super Bowl. <laughs> I don't think so, Vlad. I think he's got it. I think you're right. There's no doubt about his injury issues. And maybe that is a problem. Maybe some guys just are more prone to getting hurt than others. And maybe he's one of those guys. But I think he's a really good quarterback if he stayed healthy. Maybe I should have said that. But I, there's no doubt about his frail, his being so fragile. I think, I think this year is critical for Mac. Year three, for most of these quarterbacks that we've seen in the league, is very critical for those guys. And I, can, I think if we can get him some good weapons this year, and we already got him a good offensive coordinator, I think putting those two together, or those three things together, I think, I think he'll have a way better season this year. I think some of the doubts that we had last year will not be there. I don't think he's – obviously, he has a lot of work to do, but I, I think – I just think the way the offense is going to look this year with a real offensive coordinate, coordinator, and if we can get him some weapons, I, I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll just leave last year as an anomaly because of um, – Vlad, let me ask you this. How much blame do you give Belichick for Mac Jones's development this year? First of all, for putting in Patricia and, and Judge, okay? That's one responsibility. The next one, then he criticizes him, says he can't throw the ball 50 yards. But remember that quote? Yeah. <laughs> he can't throw the ball 50 yards. <laughs> yep. that, that was terrible. And then the other thing was, and it was, oh, the thing was Zappy, that, that when he put Zappy in, he created all kinds of trouble with the fans when they could chant Zappy, and all of a sudden, Mac Jones became an enemy. He became your starting quarterback, but he was an enemy with the fans because everybody loves Zappy. I give Bill eighty five percent of the blame, and I, I give I give Bill eighty five percent of the, the blame, and then ten percent goes to um, 15, the rest of the fifteen goes to um, goes to Matt because I I also think although he wasn't put in the best space, I also think his attitude did not help. Um, right. But but I, I give Bill almost all the blame because he created the situation and we and us on the outside all saw it we we predicted it and you know most of the time Bill proves us wrong but not this year. Would you fire him if you were Bob Kraft? No no that's that's a little Ooh. that's that's. Well, that's, that's not... well Lynchy, come on so I want to don't just stay there. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Put it, point the finger at me. <laughs> <laughs> no, as, as I as I said this morning, when I when I used to uh, do the Patriot show, and now I'd be around there on Wednesdays or Thursdays, you know, just hanging around, and and you watch a lot of body language, you see a lot of stuff, and 
and you, you, you knew that um, Kraft needed Belichick. And Bill didn't really show him a lot of love or respect um, from, and that, that's not just from me, from a lot of other people. And we always, we always joked and had a line like, well, Belichick's uh, two seven and nine seasons just when they play 16 games. He's two seven and nine seasons from being fired. Well, he's pretty close to that right now. You know, losing record last year, did not make the playoffs. And, um, you know, what if they have a losing record again this year? What if they go seven and 10 or eight and nine and they don't make the playoffs? I think that um, you're going to hear the, you're going to hear the drum beat. You yeah, know, I definitely think he's on the hot seat for sure. Like you said, Mike, if he has a couple of seasons where he's under 500 and this team doesn't make, you know, the playoffs and, and doesn't, you know, play and perform well, I, I think that seat's gotten a lot warmer for him. I definitely said give him two more years. I think that's, you know, fair and a good amount of time to, you know, give, you know, Bill Belichick because, you know, these three years that um, we've seen, uh, you know, haven't been really that good. I think they made the playoffs, but I mean, Barry, you should expect the Bill Belichick team to make the playoffs, and but you don't expect them to make the playoffs and get their ass kicked, you know, in the first round. So I, I think certainly he, you know, I, you know, he has a couple more years, um, you know, here that I think Crash should give him, and you know, we will. You should wait and see what happens if they well, play well and make the playoffs then they should keep him. If not, then I'm sorry, but it may be time for him to go. Does it matter what his record is without Brady? That's a factor. Yeah, I'd say so. I, I think, you know, a lot of his success has been, you know, correlated, you know, with, uh, you know, Tom Brady, rightly, rightfully so, because the majority of his career has been spent with Tom Brady with the exception of the last three years. Uh, so I think, you know, he needs to, you know, to say, prove, um, you know, that he can be able to lead a winning and successful team, uh, you know, and, and make a, you know, playoff run, a legitimate playoff run, uh, you know, with the team without Tom Brady, because he hasn't really done, you know, much or anything without since Tom Brady has left these last three years. So I think, you know, a, a lot of you know, people, you know, they say that he's not the same coach without Brady. And, I mean, much I hate to say it, it's, as of right now, that's pretty much true and looking pretty accurate uh, as we speak. Well, I mean, Brady's the greatest of all time. So, you know, it, those those guys don't come, you know, um, they're not drafted every single year. So, you know, I think he had to play with somebody, right? And he did the best that he could with you know, the greatest of all time. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, Belichick, you know, picked Brady, made the decision to stay with him, you know, after Bledsoe came back, you know, a lot of those things are Bill Belichick's decisions. And, you know, sometimes I feel like people forget about that, you know, you know, the first three Super Bowls that Brady won, I think was largely due in part with the defense. You know, he had top 10 defenses and had some of the best players on defense. You know, Ty Law, Willie McGin McGinnis, you know, Will Fork, um, you know, all those, all those guys. And, you know, Troy Brown making timely plays, you know. So I think he had a lot of help, and he didn't become Brady until, you know, around 2006, 2007, where he was just tearing up the league. And then it seemed like he had another – well, he did. He had another two – Hall of Fame careers and, and did what he did with the Patriots, you know, winning three more Super Bowls with us. So, you know, I think at the end of the day, when Bill Belichick is done, you know, once he's done, people are not really going to think too much about the times that he didn't have Tom Brady. You know, he he's going to go down. If he does get two more years, like Barry is saying, you know, he'll, he'll probably get the record um, and, and be the winningest coach in, in the NFL history. And um, I think is deservedly so. So I think that, you know, this year he, he'll probably have a better season than he did last year. Um, you know, does he have to win a Super Bowl to to be a success here? I don't know. You know, but I think he does have to go into the playoffs and not get blown out the first game and not the playoffs again. You know, um, that that's what my thoughts are. And um, I, I do – 
like agree with Vlad about the 85% that was definitely on Bill. You know, you bring in Matt Patricia, who failed as a coach with the Lions, you know, and players don't like him. And then Joe Judge, see what happened with, with, with what Daniel Jones over there. And he made a quick turnaround this year. So it's like, you, you probably, you know, you possibly had two of the worst coaches in the NFL come in and take over offense. And, you know, I mean, I think the whole Boston media understood what was happening and they were trying to tell Bill all off season, like, how the hell is this going to work? And, um, you know, a lot of people blame Mac, Mac Jones for, you know, being a little salty, but I think he handled it as well as he could, you know, is it, I mean, the guys calling around the league to figure out like, what the hell can we do here? Cause the coaches he got don't know shit, you know, and <laughs> what can you do with that? You know what I'm saying? And he had a few outbursts. And I think that really only says that he really cares about what's going on. He's like, listen, man, the, the quick game sucks. And I agree because, you know, us at home, we're watching this. We're like, we know exactly what's about to happen. So you think an NFL defense knows exactly what's about to happen? But, John, you don't think that was disrespectful <laughs> and insulting and then slapping the face for Matt Jones to call around to these other coaches? <laughs> And, and so particularly towards Bill Belichick, like I don't care about him disrespecting Matt Patricia or Joe Judge because they deserve to be disrespected because they didn't do anything to earn his respect. But, you know, disrespecting the head coach, I get he wasn't very good last year, but with, he's still, you know, one of the best coaches or arguably the best coach of all time. And it's like you don't want to do anything to cause, uh, you know, sort of, friction or tension between you and the head coach because we know that relationship is very important uh you know well, you know with any football team a head coach and a quarterback yeah i mean i mean honestly yeah i mean bill belichick's the greatest right but we all know bill doesn't listen to anybody but himself so you know mm -hmm. <laughs> i think that was you know an indictment on bill it's like listen all your players, you know, players were coming out in the media saying things, and I've never seen that before. So, if, you know, Bill Belichick, I think you need to pay attention to what's going on and, and, and you know, try to right that ship, you know. Um, but let, let's get back to our guests here, you know, Mike and, and Bob. Um, what do you guys think, you know, is going to happen in the, I mean, in the offseason? What do you guys hope to see the Patriots do? you know, to go in into training camp in next season. Number four comes before number five, Bob. So you can go ahead. Oh, that's good, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it all starts and ends with the quarterback in this league. I don't care. Uh, you know, I'd like to see Mac Jones turn it around. I just don't think it's a good fit for him here. And I don't, you know, I think, when we talk about Belichick, and I, I have a great admiration for him. He's a coach's son, and he grew up in that environment. He's an only child, grew up in that environment, and I, I think he's had a rather spoiled life. Uh, but I think he was a great coach and was very smart. But I think he's past his time. I think he's 70 years old, and I don't – that's no knock on it, but honest to God, you know, a lot of people I know that are well retired past 70 years old, I just can't do it anymore. And I think coaching in the National Football League demands so much, especially if you're the general manager, not only to deal with the contracts, but also to deal with the press, also not to even get to the timeouts to clock management. I mean, I just think there's a lot of things, it's almost too much for one guy to handle especially a guy that's not willing to turn over any grains for any responsibility. Uh, so I, I think there's got to be a change in the way Belichick thinks about where he's at and, you know, forget, forget a little bit about Don Shula right now and start worrying about game to game with him. I just think he's in danger of, you know, of, of being over the hill, Ooh. for lack of a better word. Bill, Belichick. Ooh, that's harsh. That's well, hard. I'm sorry, Mike, but you know, you know, it's just, look at us. 
<laughs> what do you mean? You guys still got it? You, got, you guys are good. Y'all still got it? <laughs> well, you don't have to go far for this conversation. Just look up. <laughs> I think that uh, Robert Kraft has taken uh, a little bit uh, away from Bill Belichick's responsibility. And I think we saw it right away when there was a public announcement that they had begun a league-wide search for an offensive coordinator. Now, when before have you ever, ever seen the Patriots tip their hand on they were doing anything? I mean, they wouldn't tell you if they were, if your pants were on fire. Why aren't you just telling us, saying the same thing I said? Kind of, yeah. But but I'm, I'm saying that, like, like Robert Kraft has, has, has put his finger on, on the problem where he was afraid to touch it because it was like the third rail on the, on the, on the subway. He, he learned his lesson with Parcells, and he, wasn't, he was going to just step back. And as long as Belichick was winning, he just – didn't interfere at all. But now he can't sit back and watch because he knows the, him and his family are going to be here a lot longer than Bill Belichick's going to be. And when Bill Belichick's long gone, people are, are, are going to judge the crafts on what they have done or have not done. And if they don't, did, didn't take an active role in this uh, uh, search for offensive coordinator, which was really a, a sham because it was the obvious choice all along, um, that Kraft is like Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman. He doesn't want to be liked. He wants to be well-liked. Yeah. Well-liked. Not just liked, well-liked. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I rest my case. I just, I don't think there was, I don't think the, the previous Bill Belichick, the one that was with winning the Super Bowls and in the playoffs every year and was the favorite every year, would have ever even allowed the announcement to go out that they're looking for an offensive coordinator. That's why Correct. I think things have things have just slipped between. It's like an earthquake between Kraft and Belichick. That you know the, the tectonic plates have slipped, and that we've had a you know devastating earthquakes down there. I don't know. I don't know, Vlad. I don't know about them coming back. I don't know that. That's this is not an automatic. This is not by any chance an automatic. I, I think they are. I mean, hopefully we can have you guys back on again um, whenever the season starts next year. But but I, I I'm optimistic. I'm very optimistic about the Patriots. I think I think Mac Jones will be back on track. I think I do think our defense is getting old and that we need to get younger and especially not only get younger but get those younger younger guys cap, um, captaincy, like give them leadership in, on the team. Uh, but I, I, think, I think the defense is going to be fine. I think the offense will get revamped and be better. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the season. The last couple of seasons, I, I, I got to be honest, I have not been as excited just because the team weren't looking as good. But I, I, think, I think with – Kraft stepping in and making Belichick look for an offensive coordinator. I think I think things will be better. Hope you're right. I hope you're right. <laughs> Much more fun hope, when they win. Much hope, more fun when they win than when they don't. I hope I'm right as well. Absolutely, man. Um, yeah, I hope you're right too, Vlad. Yeah. E either way, you know, uh, there's excitement, you know, around the city of Boston with the Boston sports right now. So. Hopefully these guys can come together and, and do something special next year uh, with the Patriots, just like the Celtics and Bruins are doing right now. Um, I know you guys, you know, we're wrapping up here. I know you guys ha are working, you know, on some stuff together. We want to tell our audience what you guys got going on um, so that they can, you know, join you guys on your platforms. Well, that's really kind of you. Uh, we just, you know, we do a podcast once a week, you know, we ended up, taping it this morning. We usually tape either Monday or Tuesday. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I have no idea where to get it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if Lobel and I were in charge of getting Channel 4 and Channel 5 on the air for the last 40 or 50 years, you'd be, it'd be a test pattern on there, or it'd be a black signal on there, nothing else, because neither one of us knows, has, doesn't have a clue how TV works. Hey, look how one work. day get on this show and just got get on my computer. Jeez. <laughs> you know, one, one day we were in a, a 
give us a two week notice. So I, can start. <laughs> I was in I was in the Superdome one day. We were down to was the Hot Channel Five was doing a BC Tulane game. So it was me and a cameraman. The cameraman said they had to run outside to the truck to get something, and he got locked out of the Superdome. What right we were coming on the air. Now I could just stand in front of the camera and do it, but I didn't know how to turn the camera on. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I just called the phone and said, I don't know how to turn it on, so I can't, stay, I can't even stand in front of the camera. That's how bad the, the both of us are. Okay, so Mike, where can they see the podcast? You can see it at uh, unanchoredboston.com. Uh, thank you very much. Unanchored Boston. Yeah, Lobel and I are unanchored, which means we can say whatever we want to say. Awesome. Oh. <laughs> well, that's what's up. That's awesome, fellas. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much for having us. I'm, I do apologize for showing up. Hey, well, hey guys. Guys. Well, we're just glad that you made it and glad that you came on and that you're here. So we appreciate you for, you know, Thank joining you. us and coming on tonight. Thanks, guys. It was really a lot of fun. And uh, you yes. guys do a great job. You're a lot of fun, a lot of laughs. I When they said we have two guests coming on, I said, who's the other guest? And he said, it's a surprise. And then when we when you weren't on when the thing started, I said it's got to be Lobel because he's trying to figure out how to, well, how to get so on the Mike, air. You knew. You, you oh, knew no, I, I, I get when, when the guests didn't show up at seven o'clock when the show started, and you like, said oh, it was yeah. a surprise. I knew it was him. He he knew the symptoms. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I knew knew to see the next parade. Who's going to be in the next parade? Oh, it's a, it's gonna be a two teams parade. Yeah, one day. We, we talked about it. You missed it. It's gonna be a two teams parade. <laughs> Celtics are gonna start on one side of the city. The Bruins are gonna start on one side of the city, and then they're gonna meet up in the middle. It's gonna love be it. amazing. Love it. I love the it. Only problem, the only love problem it. is which side do you go to? <laughs> oh no! I mean. <laughs> There, there are people that clearly support the Bruins more than the Celtics, and there are people that clearly support the Celtics more than the Bruins. And it's going to be great. Both fans are going to attend. And then when they come in the middle, you don't even have to choose because both teams are going to be there. That's right. Facts. That's, no, that's right, well, a good point. We'll that's see who fair. gets the duck boats and goes in the river first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we shall see. Yes, sir. Thank you guys so much. It's been a pleasure. You guys. Thank you, Bob. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Thanks, guys. Just give me a week or two notice. <laughs> we'll do definitely next time. We'll give you a week or two notice. No doubt. Such next time. I'm such an idiot. <laughs> Bye. All right. Bye. See you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. All right, Barry, Vlad, John. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Anytime you want me, just uh, give me a call. Thank you. Really yes, sir. Sure. We'll do. Absolutely. Okay. Thank now, you. the hard part is being disconnected. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, let's see. Leave, leave. All right. There we go. Great yeah. seeing you, Mike. Leave, Mike. Gonna... Okay. See you guys. <laughs> See you, Mike. Thank you. Man, um, you know, uh, I think we have a lot of guests come on, come on this show. You know, um, every week. You know, I think we do a good job bringing in, you know, some good guests. But that right there was almost a hundred years of sports right there man between those two guys you know mike lynch and um pablo bell and you know again we'd like to thank them for coming on the show you know um obviously they're veterans in this game and you know they work for boston giants in the sports industry and you know they're nothing but legends like we said and you know if you guys don't believe us man make sure you guys are following them on social media you know mike lynch i believe is lynchy wcvb um and Bob Lobel, I'm not sure what Bob Lobel is. Um, I think it's just Bob Lobel. Bob um, Lobel, right? Yeah. I think that's yeah. what it is. So, I mean, just a quick search, man. They're not hard to find. Mike Lynch and Bob Lobel, like I said, they're legends. So, you know, you don't even have to do much. Just write their names in and you'll figure out everything. And make sure you guys go listen to their podcast. And I'm really glad that they, you know, they are – coming on to the to this industry you know what i'm saying because these guys again are legends and you know i think they should be able to stay on the air as long as they want because they obviously love sports 
and love the industry. So make sure you guys are following them. Uh, make sure you guys are following us as well. We're at ProFans Sports on everything except for um, Instagram, and that's at ProFans underscore sports. You know, we're dropping content on a daily basis. We drop a podcast every week. Uh, make sure you're subscribing. Hit the black button at the bottom of the video. Uh, make sure you're following us once again. And um, thank you for watching, as always. Until next episode, man. Get out of here. Have a good week. See y'all next time.